Welcome to the Mean Lady Talking Podcast. This is the podcast that tackles tough questions about relationships, life, love, and loss. It may not be the advice you want, but it's probably the advice you need. And now here's your host, grief therapist, motivational speaker, relationship expert, best-selling author, and attorney, the not really mean, mean lady yourself, Susan J. Elliott. Today I have a few topics and I'm going to kind of dovetail into them, but I wanted to talk about when I get there, this thing about how people can easily be fooled and what you need to do in this age of over saturation of misinformation, bad information. And I'm not talking about fake news. I'm talking about people that just get a hold of an idea and then they just start spreading it like wildfire and acting as if what they're saying is absolutely true. And they don't like it if you don't agree with them. And it's not only that, but it's the amount of nastiness that comes along with it. You see it on YouTube, you see it on Reddit, you see it all over the place. I want to ask people sometimes, what is wrong with you? Don't you know what polite discourse is? How can you even do that? A couple of podcasts ago, I was talking about the Watts family murders and I was talking about Shanann Watts and her health issues and things like that. Other day, I was watching a documentary on children and relating to adults that they have been molested. And this documentary is actually interviews people accused of child molestation and I have to tell you that I consider myself between being an attorney being in the courts being a therapist and being a psychiatric clinician being in and out of hospitals treatment centers rehabs mental facilities jails all kinds of places to do psychiatric evaluations I consider myself a person who can kind of read people. And I know that when I was a clinician, some of the trouble that I got into was because I was reading people and I was disagreeing with some of my my colleagues. Anyway, I'm going to get to that. But I did some commentary on Shanann Watts and the fact that she had lupus. And I believe she said she had fibromyalgia and Lyme disease. Now, I have lupus and I've talked about lupus being a disease of distance because there is a lot of misinformation about lupus. My best friend at the time, no longer my best friend, and this is one of the reasons, when I told her that I had lupus, she didn't say anything. And then a few weeks later, brought it up and teach body language. I teach observation. I teach listening to people and kind of figuring it out. I don't do mind reading. I rail against that. It was something that was done to me by a gaslighter. And it was something that really was problematic in my first marriage. So I don't do mind reading. But sometimes you put two and two together and you know in your heart that it's true. So what I knew was that she had heard me say we were out somewhere in in person. And so she couldn't jump on the computer and research things. And I told her that I had been diagnosed with lupus. And about a week later, we're out again. And she brings up the fact that I have lupus. And I didn't know why she was bringing it up. And she says, well, you know, lupus is one of those diseases that they arrive at by deduction, meaning after they rule out everything else, you're left with lupus. And that's how they figure it out, which to me, sounded like there was doubt in her that I had lupus. And I turned to her and I said, well, let me tell you, because I hadn't shared this with anybody. I said, let me tell you what my journey to the lupus diagnosis was. And I said, you remember when I fractured my back? You remember I fractured my back, fractured my hand, things weren't healing. I mean, all kinds of things were going on with me and I recount them in getting back out there. But what I don't recount and getting back out there because this happened after it was published, I was having symptoms that were weird and wild. And I thought that I had multiple sclerosis. And I had a friend when I was in my thirties who had MS. And to be perfectly honest, I was horrified seeing her weeks after she, she fell ill. I couldn't even believe it was the same person. So when I was having these symptoms and thinking that I had MS, I was terrified. So 
I went to my primary care physician and she did a physical and she did blood work. She thought I had rheumatoid arthritis. And the reason she thought that was because the blood work came back that I had a speckled ANA, which is a blood test and, and speckled positive ANA is a sign of some autoimmune disease. So she saw my swollen fingers. You can see the inflammation in my fingers when they are swollen. You can see that when I'm in a flare, when I'm in a lupus flare, which I didn't know then what it was, I know now, you could see the inflammation in my hands. Anybody, you don't have to be a doctor. You can look at my hands and you can see it. When, when one hand is worse than the other, you can see them. And many times my right hand is inflamed and the rest of me is not having a flare at all. So lupus takes on many, many different variations. So I went to a rheumatologist. He asked me a bunch of questions. Now I'm thinking I have rheumatoid arthritis. I didn't look it up. I thought that rheumatoid arthritis was basically the swelling in my hands because that's what she had done when she was talking to me about rheumatoid arthritis. She had held my hands and when I jumped, when she touched the joints, she said, I think it's rheumatoid arthritis. So I went to a rheumatologist and he asked me a whole bunch of questions, went over all these symptoms, different things. You have this, you have that. Now, I had no idea where he was going or what he was asking or what the answer should be if I wanted to have lupus. So I just answered it and then he sent out more blood work. I came back and the blood work that he did is called a double stranded DNA. And that was also positive. So he said that between my speckled positive ANA, my positive double stranded DNA and my symptoms that I had given. And he said to me, and I remember this so clearly on the second appointment with him, he said to me, I didn't tell you this. You told me this. And then he talked about how I described how I felt when I woke up in the morning and gradually felt better during the day and then I felt bad again at night and he went through all of these things with me every single symptom that I told him about he gave me a chart of pictures of the butterfly rash but I've never had it really really bad I've never had sores in my mouth there are a few other things that I've never had that are symptoms of lupus when I first started on Plaquenil which is the first, usually the first drug that they give you. Well, first he gave me prednisone, which is a steroid. And I started to feel better. And he said to me, if you have lupus and your joints are inflamed and I put you on prednisone before the Plaquenil kicks in, you're going to feel better. And I did. And many times when I'm in a flare, he'll say to me, if you take prednisone, because I have one milligram, five milligram tablets at home all the time. And he says, and it goes away, then you're flaring. So I was okay. I was not okay. I would flare now and again for the first couple of years, but the Plaquenil seemed to be keeping it pretty much under control. And then I went into a flare and I got very sick. And if you looked at me, you would think most of the time that I look fine. I mean, there were days I couldn't get out of bed and those days were scary to me. My ex, my first husband's family, lupus runs in my first husband's family. His uncle died from it and his aunt died from it. And I remembered his aunt when I was in that family and she passed away when I wasn't in that family and she passed away from complications of lupus. So I remembered her. She was quite small, quite frail looking. And I realized when I had my lupus diagnosis that I was looking like her. I didn't look like her back when I was part of that family. I was young and healthy and vigorous looking, always been a healthy adult until this hit me. And thinking back on her, and yeah, she did look small. She did look frail. She was always cold. She had all these different symptoms that I have now, and she died of lupus. So my friend said lupus is a disease of deduction. I don't know where she got that from. I have blood work. I have the results. I want to tattoo those results on my forehead and say, yes, this is me. I have lupus, okay? Are you all satisfied? Here, here's my blood work. Check it out. I landed in the hospital a couple of years ago and they could not tell what was wrong with me, but they knew something was wrong with me. I was in incredible pain and I was, I hadn't eaten in three days and my stomach was swollen and things were going on. Nobody knew exactly what was going on. And when they did blood work in the ER that night and the ER doctor comes into me and the ER doctor says, are you sure you have lupus? And I was like, yes. And he says, because your, your ANA is negative. And I was like, okay, that's great. 
but why am I so ill? Nobody could figure out why I was so ill. I almost went under the knife twice. And in nine days, my tests were wacky. All these results, they did these T-scores, which is basically to see if you have tumor, if you have cancer somewhere in the body, they did it in different places. My T-scores were all over the map. And even though the guy in the ER said to me, are you sure you have lupus? Throughout the nine days that I was in the hospital, A, nobody could figure out exactly what was wrong with me. B, everybody knew something was wrong with me. And C, they started to say that my T markers being off and all these this other blood work, I had fluid in my lungs. I didn't have pneumonia. I didn't have a cold. I didn't have a flu, but I had fluid in my lung. And... I, they wanted to go for a lung tap. There was all these different things that went on. Every single time something weird would come back, they would go, oh, lupus, you know, it throws everything off. So the first night I get there, the guy is skeptical about the fact that I have lupus. But throughout the nine days that I'm there, the fact that they can't figure out all this crazy stuff that's going on with me, they keep blaming it on lupus. Well, it must be lupus. She has lupus. That's why it's up. So that was that. So I belong to a couple of lupus support groups. People have different manifestations of lupus. People arrive at a lupus diagnosis in different ways. I don't know how people can say to other people, you don't have it. With fibromyalgia, I remember working in psychiatric services with a woman that I thought was one of the nicest, most competent clinicians I've ever worked with. And she did not believe that fibromyalgia was real. She thought it was psychological. And I know that that was an old school way of thinking 20 years ago, but it's not now. So in the Shanann Watts case, people were saying, well, why didn't they find lupus in the autopsy. How would they find lupus in the autopsy? You would have to have inflammation in the body. And if you're not in a flare, it's not going to be there. And people are idiots, just complete idiots sometimes. And then other people were mouthing what they heard about fibromyalgia 20 years ago. It's all in their head, blah, 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 this and that. And the other thing that Shanann Watts talked about was having Lyme disease. And when I was first diagnosed with lupus and I just told, I didn't tell a lot of people because of some of this stuff. And a woman that I know gave me this long explanation about how she didn't think I had lupus. She thought I had Lyme disease. She didn't ask me how it was proven that I had lupus, but she just went on this long tear about how it wasn't really lupus. It was Lyme disease. So I don't know what was going on with Shanann with the lupus Lyme disease. I know she mentioned Lyme disease in one of her videos, but I don't know how people can say, oh, she's a liar. She had Munchausen. She tried to make those kids be sick. Ba, ba, ba. I, I don't understand how people are so nasty to a woman who was murdered when she was 15 weeks pregnant. So I brought this up before. Now, how this dovetails into child molesters, honestly, I was watching this documentary. I was blown away. And if I can find it, I will put it in the show notes. And I know that the last few, sh the last few shows, I have not put the minutes in. Minute five, this happens. And minute 10, this happens. But I will try to remember this documentary because it blew me away. You come into the documentary and there's this young, good-looking minister talking. And he's saying things that I found distasteful about how children who are troublemakers, they try to bring ministers down and ministers are always trying to be around troubled children to help them. And so it brings you in. And I did find his remarks off-putting. So there was something about him that I didn't like. I thought that maybe he was being racist. He was talking about children of color who were troublemakers. I wasn't quite sure where, where this guy was going, but there was something that I didn't like about the way he was saying, but I wasn't thinking that he was a child molester. Turns out child molester. Oh my goodness. He describes his molestations to the point where I could, I couldn't even listen. I was like, Oh my God. Oh my God. And he tells the woman who makes the documentary that people are easy to fool. And he talks about Christians being especially easy to fool because they want to believe the good in people. And I remember going on Twitter and some of you who have, some of you who have heard about my little Twitter cyberbully thing, the guy in Ohio who was really stalking me and on my case and trying to get me fired and all this other stuff. He was angry because I had posted something about a pedophile minister. And he had written to my boss and said that 
I was accusing all these ministers of being pedophiles and blah, blah, blah. But this minister was saying that it was very easy to fool Christians because they don't want to believe that their ministers are pedophiles. And I thought of the cyberbully guy when I was listening to this guy, the second guy. Oh my goodness. This is where my own expertise, my own people sense kind of took a high. Polygraph results are not admissible evidence. We all know that this guy comes on and before she introduces him, she says he took and passed a polygraph. He comes on. He was accused of adult rape with a woman. He comes on. He took and passed a polygraph. And in my mind, from working in retail as a young person, when I had to, I had to give polygraphs, well, I had to be in the room when other people administered polygraphs, and I had to take polygraphs to be in management in pharmacies because your hands have access to drugs and money. So they want to make sure that you're not a drug addict and that you're honest. So I had to take a polygraph. And then when I was a system manager in a pharmacy, I had to sit with new hires when they were given polygraphs. So I know that 99% of the time, even though they're not admissible, they're pretty accurate. And if you remember in the Chris Watts, interview the woman said they asked him to purposely lie and he does and she says kind of went off the charts and she goes well that's good because it shows that you're not a good liar and then he proceeded to lie his way through the entire polygraph and they said to him you failed the polygraph and he was like I promise you I didn't lie in the polygraph no yes you did this guy comes on dealt rapist took and passed the polygraph. He comes on. He describes what he did to this woman. He lied through that entire polygraph that he passed. When he describes what he did to this woman, you can't believe that he was able to not only pass the polygraph, but when he tells the story before you get to the point where you know that he did do the rape. You believe him. I believed him. I usually can look at people. I can look at the way they're talking. Judge Judy will always say she's a truth machine. My kids used to say that about me. I used to just sit there and look at them and say, look me in the eye. And as soon as I did that, they would fold. And I could tell absolutely when they were lying. So... I've always considered myself, like Judge Judy, a truth machine. Like, I can tell when people are lying. I do it with clients in therapy. I do it with clients in the law. I do it with their opposing counsel when I work with family services. When I'm working with sociopaths and psychopaths and narcissists, I can tell when they're lying. But this guy, I mean, totally fooled. And then the last guy was just a sadist, a brutal sadist. I couldn't watch the second part of it because it was all about sadistic child molesters I just couldn't I just couldn't do it but it was fascinating and so all of these child molesters or the rapist the guy who did the adult rape he said that people were very easy to fool he said he would go to people that he knew and go you know me do you think I would do that and the minister would say that he would go out into the community and he would work with all these different groups and all these different people where he didn't molest anybody, but he had just line after line after line of people to stand up and vouch for him. This man would never touch a child in, uh, improperly in his life, swearing on their life, swearing on their Bible, swearing up and down. I know this minister. He's a good man. He's a a wonderful man. And he would go to them and he would say, look, they're trying to ruin me. They're trying to put, put my, my congregation in jeopardy, my career. And this is all I know. And he, I guess he went into seminary when he was right out of high school. And he was saying to people, this is all I know is the ministry. And he would have people lined around the block to vouch for him. The second guy said basically the same thing. And he said, people are so easy to fool. They're just so easy to fool. And he would talk about his lies. The third guy, the third guy molested and beat up his son. He was one of the sadistic molesters. He said that he beat up his son to the point where his son was so badly beat up, he had to bring him to the hospital. And he brought him to the hospital and... The doctor said to him, how did this happen? And the father said, he fell down the stairs. And the boy said, we don't have stairs. And the wife said, nothing. Because he beat her up too. So she didn't say anything. Now, I 
was in the emergency room, which I talked about in one of my, in one of my last few podcasts. And my ex pulled me off the railing that I was hanging on to for dear life, swung me around and my face hit the newel post. And I went to the ER the next morning and the ER doctor did not believe that I fell down the stairs. That's what I said. And I wouldn't give it up. I absolutely wouldn't give it up. And in this case, and I can't imagine this, I can't imagine not killing a man who would do that to my child because it was his stepson. I mean, I would have killed my kid's biological father. I wanted to kill him when he marched them down the stairs. Had he left a mark on them, had he hit them, I think I would have blown his brains out. And this woman, because this is what happens when you're in an abusive relationship, she said nothing. And the doctor believed him. They fell down the stairs that they don't even have. And the guy was saying how many times he brought this kid to the hospital and they just didn't believe that he was beating him up. They thought this was like the clumsiest kid on the face of the earth. And all of these people said, people are so easy to fool. They're just so easy to fool. They'll believe what you want them to believe. Now, this is sickos. Now, how do you figure this out? Because we have the people on the one side who are unwilling to say anything nice about Shanann Watts. There's a woman on one of the YouTube videos. She's so nasty. I mean, she says Shanann's a liar. He hated her. Of course, he lost his mind. Bah, bah, bah. I, I, it's like he, she's basically rationalizing him murdering a 15-week pregnant woman. I, I, absolutely disgusting. And she doesn't see what's wrong with her. She said she doesn't have, she didn't have lupus. So I said to her, how can you say she didn't have lupus? And she said, she's a liar. It's been proven she's a liar. I don't know where. And she said, and if you believe her, you're a fool. And as I've talked about in other videos, other podcasts, I heard Shanann talking about being ill before anything, before anything. She said lupus before she said fibromyalgia. It took me a long time to find a video where she actually named lupus. The very first time I heard her talking about being sick, the way she described it, I said to myself, she has lupus. I had such a bad flare most of last year that there was a day, and I don't have these days almost ever, since I got out of my first marriage and I just wanted to die because of all the grief and loss and everything that came in and all the emotions that I was overcome, since that day, I hadn't wanted to die. I had a day this past fall where I was so sick, so sick, I couldn't even go to the hospital, so sick, I was begging to die. And I was just calling out to the universe, please kill me. That's how sick I was. Nobody saw it. Nobody saw me unable to even swallow my own saliva. My stomach was roiling. It was cramping. It was spasming. I couldn't even swallow a speck of saliva without it doing that. I was in a cold sweat. I was freezing. I was hot at the same time. It was disgusting. Absolutely disgusting. And I'm laying under the blankets and I'm shaking and I'm quivering and I'm, I'm just, the, the sweat is pouring off my forehead and then it's turning ice cold. I'm soaking wet, like I'm sweating and I'm soaking wet. And the minute that the sweat would, would come up, it would be cold and I'd be freezing. I was shivering and I couldn't even get out of bed. Oh my God, I want to die. I just want to die. And nobody saw that. Nobody. And it came and there was a month, uh, there was a day the month before where it was almost that bad, not quite as bad as it was that day. That was the worst day I've ever had. But it was bad the month before. And most of last year, I was sick with this free floating nausea. I couldn't get it under control. I didn't know what to do. Nobody saw me. Nobody was here when I was going through that. And the next time I went out, I looked perfectly fine. If I said to you, I wanted to die two days ago, I was so sick, you would have looked at me like I was out of my mind. So what is it? Should we be skeptical to the point of that lady where she wants oh, Shanann's a liar? She doesn't know Shanann. 
Don't know who she is. Don't know who proved that Chanel was lying. I belong to lupus support groups and almost every single time people come in and say, nobody believes I have lupus. I mean, it's disgusting. I'm not going to run around and say I have lupus if I don't have lupus. I was a healthy my entire adult life. I never said I had anything. I mean, I didn't get as much as a cold in many years. And a couple of years ago, because of lupus, I had pneumonia I couldn't get rid of. Every time I get sick, it's a bigger deal than it used to be. It just has gotten bad, bad, bad. So how do you tell the difference between, okay, that person says that Shanann Watts is a liar. She's very skeptical and nasty. She told me that if I believed Shanann, I was a fool. <laughs> I was like, I was like, how, wh- how? Can I not say the fact that you don't believe Shanann makes you a fool? Who comes up with this stuff? Do people just not think? And I know being a lawyer and a therapist, people don't think. But the other thing is, what about all the people that believe these child molesters who swear up and down? You know me. I wouldn't do that. I mean, it sounds like the same people who thought they knew Chris Watts, who was a psycho killer, sociopath, psychopath. And like, how do you balance the two things? Not being crazy and skeptical like the lady who's saying, oh, I think she's a liar. She didn't have lupus. She had Munchausen. She was a hypochondriac. Bah, bah, bah. She had those kids on all kinds of medication they didn't need. Yada, yada. I, you know, how do you, how do you guard against being that person versus being, oh, my minister would never molest a child. Where do you come? Okay, so now I'm going to tell you. Now I'm going to tell you. Observation, preparation, cultivation, surprise. GPYB. Observation. Observation. I tell everybody it is so important to observe. Put down the damn phones and listen. Step Back when you're in a crowd of people, I don't care if it's a family, friends, work, out on a date, whatever, put the damn phone away. It is important to try to read people. And I said, and I admitted fully at the beginning of this podcast that I believe that I have absolutely great observation skills. I have great sixth sense. And I've talked about feeling the vibe of a sociopath who lived across the the street from me. And I didn't get to really confirm that he was a sociopath until he started dating one of my clients. And that's a whole other story that I won't go into here. I, I might have talked about it in some other podcast. But when he moved in, I don't know what it was. He didn't look creepy. He looked like a normal guy. He was a lawyer. He had gotten disbarred um, for a whole bunch of extortion and debt and, and theft and all kinds of crazy crap. But he was a lawyer who had gotten disbarred, but he looked like a normal guy. I didn't know anything about his disbarment until my, my clients started telling me about it. There was something about him. I got this creepy, crawly feeling. And when I saw him, I crossed the street. I have that sixth sense that I talk about in the GPYP workbook. Talk about if you do observation, it is like developing a sixth sense. If you're anywhere, hang back, listen to people, look at people, notice their body language, notice the eye roll, notice the frown, notice the shrug, listen for unhealthy communication. I give you so many examples in getting back out there of healthy communication. I can say over and over and over again until I'm blue in the face, and horse that getting back out there is not a dating book. And if you wait to buy it and you wait to read it before you're ready to date, you're going to be in trouble. You're going to miss the lessons. Things like healthy communication and other unhealthy patterns between couples happen in other places. They happen at work. They happen with family. And you might be guilty of some of them. Go get getting back out there and read the part on healthy communication and then start listening for the way other people are engaging in unhealthy communication. Are they talking about other people? Are they going, are they saying, oh, that one and this one and blah, blah, blah. Is there more you language than I language? Are they using never and always and all those things that I talk about in getting back out there and in the workbook. Go there and read about it. Body language. I talk about act as if. I'm pumping up the section on body language in the new workbook, but 
you could go on to YouTube, you could go on to many different places and learn basic body language and what it means. Do the observation, put the damn phone down. Do the things that I suggest in the workbook about honing your observation skills. It is very important. I've been at this a long time. I'm trained as an attorney. I'm trained as a psychiatric clinician. I'm trained as a therapist. And I absolutely believe that second guy on that documentary. It blew me away. So I'm not fooled too often, but I can be fooled. So if I can be fooled, you can be fooled. Don't be a skeptic like that lady where she's like, everyone knows she was a liar. No, everyone doesn't know that. That's another unhealthy communication thing. Everybody knows. No, everybody doesn't know, lady. Chill the hell out. And there's no reason to say if you don't know that you're a fool. I mean, this is gaslighting. This is nasty. You don't want to be that. And you don't want to be the, oh, my minister would never abuse a child. You don't want to be that person. If somebody comes up to you and says, oh, you know me, it's like, hmm, do I really? Hmm, I don't know. You have to hone those observation skills. Anybody who has taken a boot camp with me understands that I am huge on observation. Think about if you normally hang back and don't say anything, start talking, start inserting yourself in conversation and see what people who normally think of you as somebody who hangs back, see what they do. If you normally talk a lot, hang back, see what see what they do. I talk in the workbook about people trying to draw you out and get you back where you belong because you changing the dance, you changing what they know you to be upsets the apple cart and they try to get you back to where you belong. So you have to guard against that and you have to be really, really dedicated to observing. Staying in observant mode no matter what. Stay in observation mode. If you're out to dinner with people, put the damn phones away. Look at a person in the eye. Listen for how they talk to you, how they talk to wait staff, how they react when there's no phones around or people. I've seen people sit at dinner in restaurants and they're showing each other things on their phone. Like, why do you need to do that in a restaurant? Why can't you just sit and talk and look at each other? To have a healthy life, you must hone the observation skills. You must, you must, you must. Because otherwise you're going to turn into skeptic like crazy lady or you're going to turn into my minister would never molest anybody. And you don't want to be on either one of those spectrums. It's scary, 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 scary. And if somebody tells you that they have lupus or fibromyalgia or something like that, don't go, don't go to the internet and go, oh, well, I'm going to find out about this. I was healthy most of my adult life. I have no idea why people were so invested in me not having lupus or proving that I didn't have lupus or trying to trip me up. I don't want to have lupus. I didn't want to leave my job last year because I had to go on chemotherapy and it w I was throwing up on the train. I didn't want to be throwing up on the train in front of a morning New York City morning commuter crowd. Yeah, and I'm throwing up into my laptop bag. Thank you. Yeah, that's what I want to be doing. I didn't want to be in bed dying in a cold sweat and wishing I was dead. Okay. So I don't know who these people are that think, oh, she really have lupus. They're idiots. And they don't have any right to, to question me. I would not choose this. If I had to choose a disease to have, this wouldn't be it. And I have blood work that I feel like I should carry around with me and just show it to people. Look, I do have this actual blood work that says I have this. Oi, oi, oi. And the T markers, you know, when I was in the hospital, they, they went through everything to try to figure out if these were actual readings. I had surgery a week after I got out of the hospital that I didn't need to have because I didn't have cancer. But my T markers were so screwy that they really felt like they needed to go in and, ha and do a biopsy and have surgery, which I did. I would not put myself under the knife. If there was no reason for it, if I didn't think that there was a chance I could have cancer. So that's another way of thinking about people, thinking about questions, thinking about asking things. This person who's been healthy all of her adult life, she hasn't been running to the doctor with this ailment, that ailment, another ailment. And suddenly she's in the hospital for nine days and a week later she's up having surgery and then she's over here having immunotherapy. 
ask yourself, is this what a normal person with no psychiatric history would put herself through? No, of course not. Of course not. If it doesn't make sense, it's probably not true. So me putting myself through all that for no reason, not true. I put myself through all that because I have lupus and lupus was kind of running the show. Anyway, you have any more questions about this? And I do have more. I do have more on all of this stuff and I'm working hard on the workbook so that's coming soon and I will make that announcement never a skeptic nor a oh yeah I believe that at face value B learn to observe 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 please 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 do that thank you keep yourself safe talk to you soon take care everybody